Hello, Ubuntu's from around the world. My name is Kais, and I am 11 years old, and I live in Montreal, Canada. Welcome to our Ubuntu Zoom session, where me and my co-host Lizzie, who is 15 years old and currently lives in Lake in the Hills, Illinois, in the United States, will be interviewing our guest changemaker, Wendell Kornfeld, who is based in New York. Wendell created and launched a concept called Community as Family, CAF for short, to help the elders who are aging solo become strong and build a team of support from among friends, neighbors, colleagues, and trusted professionals. Wendell's work links to several sustainable development goals, especially SDG number three, good health and well-being. Lucy and I will be asking questions to Wendell about her background, her journey, her work, and her skills, and her impact. We hope that you will enjoy this session. I, I will now be handing you over to Lucy to ask the first question. What do you do to help the senior citizens? What do I do? Yeah. Well, there's uh, several things, and um, I'm going to tie in two concepts. One is I spent several years working with anti-ageism uh, activist groups because ageism is that a is that a, a term that's used a lot in your communities? No, kind of. Yeah. Really. Okay. Okay. So ageism is where you have a bias against somebody or a prejudice or uh, negative feelings uh, because of, specifically because of their age. And it could be because somebody's older and young people also sometimes are the targets or victims of ageism. And uh, the activists in ageism wanna make sure that people of every age are respected and that they are given credibility and that they have every opportunity to participate in society and to contribute to society, no matter what their age. So that's, that's a very important aspect of the work that I do because a lot of people fear getting older, for example. They think it's gonna be a time of life that's no fun and you're gonna be ugly and um, that you won't be taken seriously anymore. You're gonna get sick a lot. And that's not necessarily the case. So I work with older people for the past six years, especially the ones that don't have a family to make sure they don't worry about getting older and that they will have a peace of mind about the fact that the older years will bring lots of great opportunities for them and that they will be able to live their lives pretty much the way they always have by having the resources that they need. And one of the biggest resources for every human being is other human beings. So that's kind of the basis of what I do is to assure people um, who are what they call solo aging, meaning you're getting older without a family nearby, to ensure that they have what they need. All right, so. Is there any way that like technology helps with? Yes, that's a great question. In fact, just the other day, I had I was interviewed by someone in Brazil who uh, wanted to know specifically how technology is really important for the work that I do. So, for example, do you guys know older people that are afraid of technology or they don't have a computer or a cell phone? Now, okay, well, I sure do. Some of them are like my own cousins. I mean, they just are just freaked out by it. They don't, they don't wanna get involved in it. They think they won't be able to do it. And you know, if you don't have access to technology these days, I'm not sure how you really live a full life because how do you communicate with people? How do you find how do you buy things that you really need for your health or for fun or for your home? Even food, like during this, this lockdown with the pandemic, you need, you need to be able to go online and order stuff. You need Amazon, you need stores, you need stuff like that. You need to be able to um, communicate with your friends and your neighbors and, and family members. Um, and say you have a, your doctor told you you have some sort of condition. Maybe you wanna learn more about it, you know? You can go, Wikipedia or 
you know, web doctor or something, and you can read up on what your condition is. And, you know, in other words, having technology is so, so important, especially for older people, because older people, the ones that I'm working with that don't have family, they tend to get more isolated than most people. So not having access, can you imagine if you lived alone and you couldn't go out much and then you didn't have a cell phone or you didn't have a, a tablet or a laptop? I mean, can you imagine how isolating that would be? Yeah, so you're, so guys, you're right, you're right. The technology is super important to the work that I do with older people. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about ageism. Um, for younger people, do you ever feel that you're not taken seriously enough by some older people? And by older, you can make it as, you know, five years older than you or 50 years older than you. But do you ever feel like you're not taken as seriously because you're too young? Do you ever have that experience? No. Oh, Lizzie, you, did you say yeah? Sometimes. Sometimes? You know, like in my agility classes, I'm yeah. like over the age of 60. I'm the only one that's like, lower no. so. yeah so so sometimes you're more aware of your age and maybe that they're not seeing you as a peer would that be correct yeah, yeah. i understand that yeah when i started doing this work on anti-ageism uh i was in a focus group i was leading a focus group of people about my age and also a lot of younger people and they were all i would say in their early 20s and they, they, I asked them, I said, how does ageism affect somebody your age? And one of them couldn't wait to tell me. She had to vent, you know. She said, you know, when you're younger, if, especially if you're not married by the time you're like you're in your early 20s, uh, older people think that you're not really an adult yet, you know, you, that you haven't taken on an adult life, even though if you've got the years that qualify you as an adult, if you don't have a, a spouse or you haven't bought a house yet, you don't have a car, if you don't have children, this and that, that, you know, you're still in the kid zone and that could last till you're, like, you're in your thirties or more. And she said, this is a real problem for me and some of my friends is that, you know, we're, build, we're trying to build a career and be taken seriously as professionals. And some people just want to keep us in this box that we're not, that we're still kids. Yeah. What can you see out your window? What can I see out my window? What a great question. I'm on the 26th floor of the Upper West Side of Manhattan Island. And I have a great view I'm looking at a lot of clouds and very often, because I'm between two big parks, very often um, red tail hawks fly right by the window. And sometimes they sit right on my terrace rail and they are really big birds. I don't know if you've ever seen one up close, but they're big and they're raptors, you know? And uh, they sit outside my window on the railing and I usually jump about a foot if, if I see them land. Um, and I'm also looking out at the tops of lots of uh, apartment buildings and skyscrapers. And um, it's a beautiful view of New York City. And in the very distance, I can see the George Washington Bridge that connects Manhattan to New Jersey. Okay. So how did you like get into this like type of work? Um, be, that's a great question as well, because, you know, I don't know if you've noticed how maybe your, your parents have helped your grandparents with things over the years. Like if your grand, if you have grandparents that are in your life, um, maybe your parents help the grandparents from time to time or your, or aunts and uncles that are older, something like that. So about... 20 years ago, I realized my husband and I were, t were doing a lot of stuff for our parents as they got older. They were really counting on us to help them with things, to make decisions, whether to stay in their house, whether to move somewhere, or they couldn't drive anymore and they needed that help. And 
my husband and I don't have kids. So at about 20 years ago, I started thinking, well, gee, what if I have the same problems my parents had, my in-laws, and I don't have adult kids to help me? And I started talking to all my friends who don't have adult kids, of which I have a lot. And we all said, all right, so how are we gonna get by? So I said at the time, why don't we learn how to do things ourselves and take care of each other? So that really blossomed. So about se uh, going on seven years ago, I came up with this concept of how to build a community family from among your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, if you're working, and uh, professionals, you know, like doctors, lawyers, accountants, things like that. And you need to build like an A-team for yourself. So I came up with a structure on, on how you can do that. And if you live alone, things you need to do to protect yourself if something happened to you while you lived alone. Um, and I think because of COVID, we're all learning a lot about, you know, what if you got sick and there's nobody else in the house with you ever? And what if you need help? So we come up with all of these, what I call empowerment strategies so that people who are living alone, especially older ones, that they have a way to have uh, an A-team of support and that they have structures in place so that if something goes south, you know, goes wrong or whatever, you don't say, now what do I do? You, you have a plan. So, I, so in answering your question, I got into it because I realized I needed something like that and it didn't exist. So I started my own. And I've been for the past um, six, a little over six years now, I have been working with senior groups and senior centers and churches and synagogues and groups of friends and neighbors all around the country and uh, helping them set up these kind of groups so that they have a community family of their own. How long have you been involved there? Yeah, so I started, I came up with the concept in the, at the end of 2013, and I launched in February of 2014. So it's just over six years now, and there's been a lot of articles written, um, either by myself or interviews, people have called me or written me up. And I spoke at the United Nations uh, Committee for the Aging a couple of years ago. They're an international audience. They wanted to know more about it. So I did, I'm sure you're familiar with PowerPoint presentations. I did a PowerPoint for the committee to the UN. So it's been, I would say the most exciting and satisfying work I've ever done. And I worked for 46 years for pay before that. So if I say this is the best job I ever had, I'm serious. <laughs> I get to meet really great people. Yeah. So how did like COVID change like your work? How did yeah. It well, the people that, you know, I would always, I would always try to tell people, you know, if you live alone, um, if you get sick, you need to make sure somebody's got the keys to your apartment, that they can get in, that you have a way of calling them from any room in your house, really. And, um, I don't know if it works this way in Canada, but here in the US and especially in New York, what, you know, if the fire department comes to your home for some reason, like they get an emergency call or the EMS, the emergency medical service, they come. If you're unconscious, if, if you can't communicate with them, they look on your refrigerator to see who you are, you know, who they should call, what your medical conditions are, and the refrigerator is where you have that kind of emergency information. So that's something I teach the groups. And some people are really great. They, they start getting plans together for just in case right away. And some people, they don't wanna think about it and they, they don't do it right away. So what COVID has done, considering how quick you can get sick and get sick fast, you know, um, they realize that they are more vulnerable than they realized. And it, it really kind of lit a, f a fire under people to make sure that they had a plan just in case. So I would say COVID to answer your question, 
revealed the urgency of having a plan and being prepared, especially if you live alone. What was the hardest part about growing up? The hardest part of growing up? Um, okay, the hardest part of growing up, and I'm gonna say growing up means uh, it's, I didn't want to turn 21, like most people wanted to turn 21 because it meant they were adult and they could do more things legally, right? And I remember thinking, oh no, once I'm legally an adult, I can't get away with as much, you know? <laughs> it, it would be more of my parents' fault or they'd have to get me out of the trouble or whatever. And it was um, very sobering to think that everything I did and said and influenced after that point was all on me to make sure I didn't mess it up. Yeah. All right, well, I don't think I have that many more questions. Okay. No, I don't really have any more. Okay, well, so you asked unless, uh, great Lizzie, questions. you have any more? Yeah, I have a couple. Okay. okay. What was your I'll life like growing up? What was my life like growing up? I grew up in a suburb of New York called Queens. It's one of the five boroughs of New York City. And uh, we had a, a nice piece of property. So we had um, badminton court and croquet court. And um, my mom was in charge of all of the vegetable gardens. My father was in charge of the flowers, the grape arbors. We made our own wine. And it was a beautiful, quiet neighborhood with lots of trees. And there were a lot of great kids. And I still have my two best friends from when I was four. We're still in touch. <laughs> and it was, I would say, an idyllic childhood. I had uh, great parents and great friends and a big extended family and good teachers. So, you know, I can't, I can't blame anything on my childhood on any mistakes I make in as an adult. I can't say it's all so-and-so's fault. It, it was really a nice time to grow up in a nice place, yeah. And then my last question is, what do you do while volunteering? What do I do? Um, what I do, besides the community is family stuff, which is all volunteer. I don't charge for any of that. For 10 years, I've worked in Central Park and I do land maintenance. And it's very rugged work, very uh, physical work. We do everything from pulling uh, saplings, young trees out of the ground to make room for the, the, the plants. We do weeding and raking and uh, mulching and uh, picking up litter. Uh, just about everything you can think of to make sure that Central Park is, um, is healthy both aesthetically, so things look good, and, and to make sure that uh, in an ecology uh, sense of the word, that you've taken out the invasive species so that the good plants can grow better and thrive. So, and I love getting dirty because I loved to play in the dirt when I was a kid. And I love putting on my uniform twice a week and you know, getting down and dirty. We've shoveled snow. Um, we, everything that needs to be done year round in the park. So I do that one or two days a week for the past 10 years. And that's the best volunteer job I ever had. Yeah. All right. Well, I just thought of one more. Do you have yeah. any advice for people who want to do work like yours? Yeah. Working with the older people, you mean? Yeah. Um, I would say everybody has something to contribute in this world. And I figured out what my thing was. And once you find your niche of what it is you do well, you know, do whatever you can so that the world is a better place for it and that your friends and your neighbors, your relatives, that, that you share with them what it is you want to teach them or to give them and then allow them to do the same for you. And because none of us get through life, you know, all by yourself, we really do need other people. So figure out what it is you love and what you can give and then go with it. All right, so unless anybody has another question, I'm gonna 
end it now. So okay, it's been a you. pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Wendell and Lucy, for the great discussion and for everything that we learned today. Thank you, Abutus, for listening to this interview. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter and to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can hear about upcoming sessions with other changemakers. Please also tell your friends about Aboot and share our social media links with them. And last but not least, go to aboot.co to learn about opportunities to collect digital badges and help us draw down carbon. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.